Okay, let's get virtually going here. And uh, but I'm not going to talk about that. I cheated. Ooh. Yeah. So right. So yeah. Uh, I'm just going to continue the last talk because I only got halfway through. And then we'll see what happens. If I have time, then I'll virtually I'll start on the virtual fundamental classes. Okay. So um, it, last time we ended up with this Gauss-Bonnet theorem that says that uh, the, if you have x dualizable, so more or less just smooth over k, then the SH Euler characteristic is smooth, but it's smooth and projective, sorry, then this is equal to pi x lower star of the Euler characteristic of the tangent bundle. So I just want to, we went through a lot of these consequences, but just to have them all in one spot, let me list a bunch of them. So um, yeah, we talked about what happens if you embed k into the complex numbers, then this is um, equal to the topological Euler characteristic of the C points. And if you embed it into the real numbers, then if you take the signature, so this is, the, of course, the rank, but this is, that's all that's there. And if you take the signature, you get the topological Euler characteristic of the real points. Okay. And then the next point was for x smooth projective of odd dimension over k that says that the Euler characteristic is just some multiple of the hyperbolic form. Okay, so for what happens for x cellular? So what does cellular mean? It means it has a, you can write it as a, you know, you stratify it and so it becomes written as a disjoint union of locally closed subsets. Xi is then an affine space of some dimension. That's cellular. Maybe it should be smooth. Then the Euler characteristic of X. Well, I mean, it's, I can write it this way. This will tell you what the Chow groups are. You, the Chow groups of dimension n things are just the number of cells of that dimension. So another way to write this, just in terms of the Chow groups, you take the even Chow groups of x. Take, it's a free abelian group with finite rank. You take the rank times the form x squared. So you have that many copies of that form. And then you have the rank of the odd Chow groups times the form minus x squared. Okay, so that tells you in particular, so for example, classic example is you take x to be a projective space over the field and you have one cell in every dimension from zero to n, so that tells you that the Euler characteristic of Pn is either equal to, um, get this, n over n plus one over two times the hyperbolic form, so that's for n odd, and n over 2 times the hyperbolic form plus the one-dimensional form with coefficient 1 for n even. And in fact, um, if x, for x, a very Brouwer variety over k of dimension n, so that means if you go up to the algebraic closure, it becomes isomorphic to projective n space then, in fact, the Euler characteristic of x is equal to the Euler characteristic of Pn. Also kind of boring, so you don't get any interesting invariant there. And the reason is, if n is odd, then you can use this one. So the odd case, it's just hyperbolic. And the number, remember, is just gotten by some topological information. So that's that. And if n is even, the point is, and odd, use uh, 
two and uh, yeah, use two and n even implies that there exists an odd degree extension, say L over K, such that X over L is isomorphic to projective space of dimension N over L. And here's a fact. For an odd degree extension, the map of the grotendieck witt group of K, so into the grotendieck witt group of L is injective, so you want to check an identity here, you can check it there, and then we know what it is. What is the SP variety? Yeah, so, so I said it's, it's a, in other words, there exists finite extension with X over L isomorphic to PN. That's the definition. Okay. So, one other nice So, maybe just to, yeah, I'll make one other remark. So, where are we? We're on 4. Okay. So, for X smooth and projective, the Euler characteristic of x is minus minus 1 to the dimension of x times pi x lower star of the Euler characteristic, not of the tangent bundle, but of the differentials. So why does this make sense? Remember, this thing lives, where does this live? This lives, so if this has dimension, let's call this d, this lives in h d on x, and now the coefficients are milner witt d of omega x inverse. Because omega is the, you know, the diff is the, is the determinant bundle of big omega. But the point is you can always change L to L inverse. And you don't get an iso, you get an isomorphism on the groups because if I multiply by the square of omega, it changes the omega inverse to omega. So this thing, this little change of coordinates, I can also consider this as an element in here. And then I can push, then it makes sense to, to push forward to the GW. Okay, so, um, and so this fact is just, so let me, just some remarks about this. Let's see. What about, ah. Number two follows from a more general fact that if you have V over X, a uh, vector bundle of odd rank, so then you have its Euler class. This is in odd rank D. This is in H D X Milner Witt D determinant inverse of V. And then what you can do is you can multiply by eta. Eta is in uh, Milner Witt K minus one. So it goes into H D X. Milner Witt d minus 1 determinant of v, then this gives 0. Then eta times e of v equals 0 for the odd rank. And so, um, another way, so what does that tell you? If you, this is, now if x happens to be projective and you can push it down, right, that says for x odd dimensional uh, project smooth and projective when you take pi x lower star of E of the tangent bundle, this is in the grotendieck witt group, then here multiplication by eta, this is the k milner witt 0, it multiplies to k milner witt minus 1, which is the witt group, which is equal to the grotendieck witt group modulo h, well, modulo h, whatever, 
then then this thing goes to zero in here. So it means it's in H, right? Lives in H. Which the ideal, remember I mentioned the ideal generated by H is just the set of multiples of H. Because when you multiply a quadratic form of rank M times H, it just gives you M times H. Yeah? I didn't say why. But the reason is this. Here's the cute reason. It's because, see, remember, I don't know if you remember, but the, de the determinant line bundle in some sense acts on this whole thing. So if you take some non-zero scalar in, uh, in the field, and you multiply this bundle by that scalar, it's an automorphism, it multiplies this class by the scalar to the rank, multiplies to the D. Now if D is even, that's a, I mean, it, so the point is, if you multiply here by lambda, it induces multiplication by lambda to the d on here. Okay? So that already tells you, now if d is even, that doesn't do anything because the square is always trivial. But if d is odd, then it says that any quadratic form times this thing is, uh, well, it satisfies, in other words, 1 minus lambda times ev is 0. So anything in the augmentation ideal kills this thing. And, uh, well, that's not quite enough. And then, then you do this little trick. If you pass from k to k adjoined t, right, it's injective on the grotendieck witt group, and it says that uh, 1 minus t times, you know, the pullback, but let's just call it e of v is 0. Okay, but then you have this boundary map associated to k, the local ring, ktt, you take this boundary map, or let me say t, right, even better, t minus 1 times this thing is 0, you take the boundary map at t equals 0, the, the boundary of this thing is eta, and the boundary of this thing is 0, and this comes from k, so it's a, it's a derivation, so you get this. That's the, that's the argument. Because the boundary zero of t is eta. Okay, so, cute, huh? Good. Okay. And, uh, for, for, this is a general fact that the Euler class of the dual of v is minus minus one to the rank of v to the rank of v times the Euler class of v. And this was proven for determinant of v equals trivial guy. This is proven by um, Asok and Fazel, and then I sort of slightly modified their argument to prove it in general. Okay, right, because the, um, so this thing is the dual, the tangent bundle, so it introduces this. Okay, some remarks, and then we had, uh, maybe we already said if you have z inside of x, closed immersion of co-dimension c in smooth varieties over k, then the Euler characteristic of x is equal to the Euler characteristic of x minus z plus minus 1 to the C times the Euler characteristic of Z, and this gives rise to a blow-up formula. So if you take, let's take the same Z inside of X, and uh, then we have the blow-up of X along Z, call that X tilde, with the exceptional divisor E. So the E is a projective space bundle over Z, and remember I, I mentioned that the Bundles, it's a Zariski locally trivial uh, projective space bundle. So the Euler characteristic of E is just the Euler characteristic of the projective space times the Euler characteristic of Z. And you use the usual business of saying that X tilde minus E is the same as X minus Z. Anyways, putting this all together, you get the following formula, 
which may be <laughs> running out of room to write it, but it says that the Euler characteristic of the blow-up is equal to the Euler characteristic of x plus um, the sum i equals 1 to c minus 1 of minus 1 to the i times the Euler characteristic of z. All right, this term, this term is essentially the Euler characteristic of the projective space bundle minus the Euler characteristic of z. Okay, good. So those are some amusing little tidbits. Um, this term here, this term here is the contribution from E. And E is a projective space bundle of dimension C minus 1 over Z. And the projective space of dimension C minus 1 is exactly, the Euler characteristic is this sum except for the term I equals 0. And then you have to throw off the contribution from Z. You have to subtract that off and that gets rid of the term I equals 0. Okay, so that's um, a list of interesting facts about this. Some explanation. So, the next thing I want to talk about are these <clears throat> yeah, Riemann Hurwitz type formulas, Zoyton Segre formulas, something along those lines. So the basic, um, so here's basic problem. So given, so a map, let's take to a C here, these are both smooth projective and the map and C is a curve and let's say that uh, that the fibers that only there are only finitely many singular fibers well of course that's in characteristic zero that's automatic but let's say singular fibers with and in, t in total, only finitely many singular points on the singular fibers. So the question is, can you find a formula so at each of the singular points, you have, I mean, it's, in other words, these, are, these points are just given by the differential of this map being zero. Right? That's how you tell if something is singular. And this is the same thing as saying that the differential of this map has only finitely many zeros. Well, yeah. Right, because it's a map to a rank. Right? It's a map from the tangent bundle here to the tangent bundle here. That's dimension one, so it's, it's either surjective or it's zero. Okay, and um, at each of those places, this is saying that this has only isolated zeros as a section of some bundle. And so in uh, algebraic geometry, you can then, you have sort of a local invariant which tells you the multiplicity of the zero at that point, and it compares the Euler character, you can tell what the Euler characteristic upstairs in terms of the Euler characteristic downstairs and the number of singular points and some other little bit of other data. So the classical case is when X is a curve, then you have the classical, so riemann hurwitz formula So if you have, let's say, x1 up to xl are the places where df equals zero, 
And um, so it means locally, f, if you take a local parameter, so let's let ci equal f of xi, and take a local parameter, tci, local parameter at ci in c, and then you can take f star of tci, and you write that as some unit times the local parameter at xi to some power ni, right, this is the local, this, well, x is a curve, so it has local parameters, then what's the relation? That if you take the uh, sum of the ni minus ones, then uh, this is equal to what? It's equal to the um, 2g gx minus 1, then maybe, how's this minus? Let's see, so this is, let's do a differential, this, uh, minus 2gc minus 2, something like that, right? Times the degree of f. No, is it plus or minus? Yeah, right. Um, no, 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 wait a second. Plus or minus? Well, I think it's plus. Let's see. Yeah. Okay, so that's the classical riemann hurwitz formula. We want to give a quadratic refinement of this. So our goal is quadratic refinements. Okay, so you know this is an Euler characteristic. This is an Euler characteristic times some data for f, and this is telling you something extra that's going on. So um, the problem is for us that df is not a section of it's a section of something to do with omega of x and omega of c. So note that df well. You can think of it as a section on x of omega x over c tensor f star of little omega, which is the same as big omega, of c inverse. So the Euler characteristic we saw can be computed using this thing, Euler characteristic of x, and the Euler characteristic of c can be computed using this thing, but what about the Euler character? Somebody asked about the Euler characteristic of a tensor product. And there it is. So this df is going to have something to do with the Euler characteristic of the tensor product. And we need a formula for that. And we also need to know something having to do with local contributions. These have to do with the local zeros of df. So let's first talk about the second thing. What about local contributions? Or local ind indices. For an Euler class. Okay, so remember if, um, okay, so remember for v to x, a vector bundle, we define the Euler class is well, with zero section S0, is S0 upper star, S0 lower star of one on x. And this is sort of living all over x, but of course I can, if I had another section, S, is another section, then you know these two things are connected by a linear family. So this pullback map won't depend on, I could use S just as well as S0. So this is also S upper star of S0 lower star of one. But it doesn't give me anything. But the idea is, let's say S is zero at some smaller sub, it's a non, it's not the zero section. So where it's zero is some proper subset of Z of x rather, and I should be able to get a local uh, class out of this thing with supports nz that when I forget the supports, it gives me back my Euler class. That's the idea. Okay, so we want to do that. So that's because I can do that by taking, I have to do that here. If I can find a class on v with supports on the zero section, 
such that when I forget the supports, I get this push forward, then I just pull that back and I'm done. So that's the Tom class. So the Tom class of V will be an element in H, let's say this has rank N, H, N on V with supports on the zero section of X and with coefficients in Milner, Witt, K, N of the determinant inverse of V. Okay, so how do you construct this? Well, there are lots of ways to do it, but one way is just um, noticing the following. So we can compute, remember the cohomology on V of this sheaf. This, is, this, is, this will be a special case of a more general, is equal to the cohomology of my, you know, Roast, Gerst, Gersten Roast complex. Okay, and so this is a complex of sheaves, and it's built, they have their, you know, automatic support, right? In, in some degree, it's just a disjoint union over x, co-dimension, whatever, co-dimension p, i x, lower star, of Milner, Witt, C, N minus P, and then I have to twist by this determinant of V tensor some orientation sheaf for X, right? This top wedge of the maximal ideal modded square dual. Okay, so these are this is supported on X. So if I take this complex, this is the complex. Let me call it just G of X and I restrict it to g of x minus u, of course, that's just projecting on the terms x living in u. So this is a surjection, and the kernel then will give me a complex whose cohomology calculates the cohomology with supports. That's this thing here, g, sorry, x was x, this is on v. This is V minus the zero section of X. And this is now supported on X. And so this complex will compute the cohomology with supports here. And what is this complex? Well, up to the twist, it's just the uh, Gersten complex for K Milner N, uh, well, N minus N, K Milner zero, because the co-dimension is N. And let's keep track of the twist. Let's just write down what that is. See, we've twisted by the determinant inverse of V, and then when you want to twist by the normal bundles, if you take a point on the zero section and the normal bundle in the V direction is just, it's, it's determined, it's just the determinant of V. So everything cancels out and we're just left with what? What are we left with? So this complex computing the cohomology with supports along the zero section so what is this complex this complex v this gerson complex is just equal to it's the gerson complex for milner witt zero So K of X going to disjoint union X in X1, Milner bit minus 1, K of X times the orientation sheaf for X, but viewed on X, etc. I X lower star, I eta, well I x or star
Okay, that's this complex. It's just the Gersten complex for Milner vid zero, but now this is in degree n. Okay, so what does that tell you? It tells you that H n S zero on V Milner vit n determinant of minus V is just equal to H zero on X Milner vit zero without any twist. And here, remember, here you have the one on X. And so it goes to a particular element in here, which we call the Tom class of V. And this is, in fact, how you define the push forward. I mean, I didn't tell you how to define I just said there was one. And using this identity, this Tom isomorphism, so to speak, when you forget supports and pass to here, so you're, you're not going to be able to see why this is true because I never gave the definition of the push forward. This goes to this class here goes to the or goes to S0 lower star of 1 on X. Okay, so that achieves what we wanted to do. So now we can make the following definition. So let's let S be a section of our V. Let's let Z equal the zero locus just as a closed subset contained in X. Is there a question? Well, because what happened to the twist? Because at this point, what's the twist supposed to be? I'm saying this is just a subcomplex of my original complex, right? And so here, what's the twist supposed to be? It's supposed to be the orientation sheaf at the generic point of X viewed on V. But then tensored with, I have to twist by this determinant inverse of V. Right? That's the, that's the twist. Well, if here's X and here's V, what's the normal bundle? It's V. So this is the top wedge of V times the top wedge of the V inverse, and it cancels out. Yeah, thanks for asking. I should have said that. Good. Okay. So we define the Euler class for V with respect to the section S with supports to be equal to S upper star of the Tom class of V. And this lives in, so this was rank N, this lives in HN Z on X Milner Witt N that inverse of V. Okay, and it has the property that when I forget supports, I'm going here. This just goes to the Euler class of V. Okay, so a special case. Let's say that the rank, this is what we're going to be interested in, rank of V equals the dimension of X. And then if we have a general enough section, we'd expect that it has isolated zero. So let's say Z is equal to X1, XL, closed points of X, so Z was the locus S equals zero. Okay, then of course, now for each X, we have the inclusion I, X, J, lower star, and the same kind of argument tells you that when I want to map to, uh, this is the lower star with supports, and I want to map in HN with supports on XJ of X determinant inverse of V. So this is now a codimension. Oh, sorry. I forgot the. So it's codimension endpoint, and the same kind of argument. I mean, there's nothing special about the zero section inside of V. 
Okay? So here I have to compensate in order to get the push forward. The change in the orientation sheaf will be by what? It'll be just by the tangent bundle, the tangent space, the top wedge of the tangent space at x. And so where will that be? That will be, I get the, it right, sorry. Uh, let's see, I wanna, so this will be by, I guess, the dual of that tangent space. And the dual of the tangent space is, uh, let's see, if this were omega, then I get, yeah, so I think what I have to do here, here's h0 on xj with coefficients in Milner, Witt, and 0. Same kind of story. And then, again, by I, xj, upper star of the determinant inverse of V, tensored with, um, let's see, so what is the, Sorry, I think it's, uh, it must be omega x over k uh, inverse. Yeah, I think that's what it comes out. It doesn't really, inverse plus or minus doesn't matter, but let's just, I think that's what it is. That's what you need to put in there. Because the, um, this is the, this is the tangent space. Yeah, that's what you have to, right. Okay, so that's what it turns out. And so your class here, remember your class Z, so EZ of VS will split up as a sum of terms, right? It maps to a term here, and it will come from something which we'll call E sub XJ of S. In other words, this guy here is going to be a sum of i x j lower stars of e x j of s. And the e x j s's are here. And what is this? Well, remember the Milner vit zero is just the Grotendieck vit group. So up to this twist, this is a twisted Grotendieck vit group. If this happened to be the trivial sheaf, this would just be the Grotendieck vit group of k x j. This is essentially Grotendieck Witt group of the field KXJ with, you know, with some extra twisting there, which in the end will be zero. Okay, so that's the local contribution in the special case of a, let's see, special case of a section with isolated zeros of the right dimension. Okay, good. So now let's go back to our problem. That's the first part of the problem. Those are the local contributions corresponding to these ni minus ones in the classical riemann hurwitz formula. And the other problem was uh, this problem here. I want to get an Euler class of this tensor product bundle. So here we have a general, sort of half general theorem, which computes what that is in a half of the cases, or some of the cases. There's a condition on the twisting line bundle that enables you to get a nice formula. So here's the theorem. I'm not going to say really anything about the proof, but let me just mention the computation. Okay, so what about the twist? We have the following theorem that, so again, V to X, vector bundle, rank n, L to x, a line bundle, and let's assume that L is isomorphic, or we actually fix an isomorphism of L with the square of some other line bundle for some line bundle m on x. Okay, we assume it's a square line bundle. Then, so just notice, we want to calculate the Euler characteristic of V tensor L in terms of the Euler characteristic of V. And here, 
it's going to live, what's the determinant of V tensor L? It's the determinant of V times the determinant of L to the rank of V. But the determinant of L is the square of the determinant of M, so we'll always be changing the determinant bundle here by a square line bundle, so they actually can be viewed to live in the same place. So it makes sense to put an equality here plus, and now here's the fun part, you do the following thing. You have the usual churn classes. These live in, you know, Chow groups or cohomology of Milner sheaves. Okay, so this is an intersection in the cohomology of Milner sheaves. We have the usual churn classes of V. This is the sum I equals 1 to N. We have this, so this lives in some, then times uh, H. So what does that mean, times H? So it makes sense, so let's make sense out of, so this part we already made sense of. These live in the same group, and why does this live in the same group? Well, remember, we have these milner witt sheaves for some N, with a twist by some line bundle LMNN. It's another line bundle, okay? Because I've already used these. And remember we had, if we mod out, mod out by eta. This gives us the usual Milner sheaf in degree n. So what about the map multiplication by this element h? Right, we had the element h in it's some global element, it's equal to 1 plus, or rather 2, plus eta times minus one, and this corresponds to the usual hyperbolic form under the, uh, this is in Milner bit zero of anything, which is the same as GW. Okay, so I can certainly multiply by H. On the other hand, H times eta is zero, right? So this, right, that's what multiplying by H, I'll call it that. So we have a map, multiplication by H, multiplication by H from here to here descends to a map from here to here. And if you think about it for a second, if you again look at this mod eta going back to here, this is multiplication by two. Okay, so good. So this is in... This is in Hn of x, Milner n, but then when I multiply it by h, I can put it back in whatever Milner bit sheaf I like. I don't, doesn't care about the twist, and that's where this is taking place, right? Wherever this is supposed to take place. So that's the theorem. Okay, is that uh, the setup clear? I'm not going to say anything about the proof, but that's just so you can tell all the pieces live in the right place. And so that's great because now we're in a world where we know how to calculate. We have these lower churn classes of the vector bundle V, and we don't have lower Euler classes. So this kind of formula can't possibly exist if we just stay in the world of milner witt sheaves. Okay, so now we apply this. To the situation we were in. So we take, take our map as before, F from X to C, this is our curve, everything is smooth and projective, we assume the following, that um, first of all, that the canonical sheaf on C is the square of some line bundle, some M. Secondly, that DF has isolated zeros, And maybe for simplicity, let's just assume that isolated zeros x1 up to xl, and let's assume that uh, these field extension degrees are separable. Okay. And um, maybe I just get rid of this guy here. Let's assume that. Then. Okay. 
Oh yeah, so okay. Then, if I take minus minus one to the dimension of x times the Euler characteristic of x plus one half the degree down to k of uh, c, oh, let's see, this is, let's say, n equals the dimension of x. C n minus 1 of omega x over k times the pullback of C1 of omega C over k inverse this degree. So that's just a number, but I can take that number times h. This is equal to the sum well, I have these local guys here of df. It turns out that under all these hypotheses, this will, remember in general, this will live in a twisted Grotendieck-Witt group. Under all these hypotheses, actually just the twist is trivial, or a square. Twist, twist is a square, so I can take this as an element in the Grotendieck-Witt group of kx, and then you have this uh, trace map, which is the same as the push forward, I'll say a little bit about there's a there's a trace map on quadratic forms for finite separable extensions. Okay, so that's the formula. So let me just say a word about this trace map. So if we have L over K finite separable, then we have this, you know, we have the trace form. Right, so you take a basis E1 up to E, I don't know, M for L over K, and then you look at the matrix, trace from L down to K of EI dot EJ. This is a symmetric matrix, so it corresponds to some Q. This is the trace form. This will be trace of one from L down to K in the quadratic form, but it's in here. And now if you have a one-dimensional form, you can just, if I change this to I just take u times this thing, well, the trace of this, sorry, u times this. And then, of course, for an arbitrary quadratic form, it's a sum of one-dimensional forms, so I just add up. So that's how you define the trace map. This defines a trace map from the Grotendieck-Witt group of L to the Grotendieck-Witt group of K. So it just, it's the push forward in the sense that I didn't define, and this is how you define it in this, it's very explicit. Okay, so that's my formula, and it follows from the theorem, just noting, formula follows from theorem, by two things, one, C1 of uh, this omega on C over K inverse squared is zero because you're coming from a curve. So that means that the F star of the C1 squared is zero. So all these higher terms in here, you only have the first term when I is uh, one, well, this is zero, but then you have C1 of M, which is the square root, and that accounts for the half. That gives you the half. And secondly, that this trace from, so then apply pi x lower star to the formula from the theorem. I mean, in this special case where you take S, right, formula from the theorem, noting that, that the Euler characteristic of my, yeah, maybe I should write a little bit more. So 
I went to all this trouble to define these local invariants, local indices, so where did these come in? They come in right now. Why is this the long the help? Because in the formula, in the theorem, I have an M instead of an L. L is M squared. So C1 of M is one half C1 of L. If I just count, I'm just counting degrees. So if I were to make this, if I were to change that M to an L and take the degree of that intersection, I'd get twice of what I have if I left it an M. So I have to divide by two to get the M back. I just didn't want to write M in the formula. There's no need to. That's where the half comes from. So, um, so what I'm doing is I'm taking this formula and I'm applying it to the case E of omega x tensor F star of omega C over K inverse equals E of omega x plus this sum. Well, plus this thing involving the C1s times H, okay? And then I apply pi x lower star. So what does it do? When I take pi x lower star here, it just gives me the degree times h. When I take pi x lower star here, it gives me minus minus 1 to the dimension of x times the Euler characteristic of x. And what does it give me here? Here it gives me pi x. So this thing, remember, is after I forget it's, this is equal to ix, the sum of the ij lower stars of these local contributions. Is that what I wrote? Yeah. Right? So I get on this side, I get pi x lower star of, I get a sum, ij x lower star of e x j d f. Okay, but see, if I take a point, if I take my x j, and I include it into x and then push it down to spec k, that's the same as just taking, you know, pi xj lower star, which as I'm saying is given by this trace map from kxj down to k. So this thing here is the same as the sum of these traces. Okay, so that explains all the pieces in the formula. All right. So what happens to the C and the S I of U? That's in this bracket here. That's this stuff here. See the C1M and the C... That whole sum just becomes one term when I is one. Because I take... Think of the M as an L. It's just half of L. So I have a C1M times a C1L to the I minus one. That'll have exponent at least two when I is bigger than one. That's C1, that's half of C1 of L to the I. And N is the dimension of X. N is the dimension of X. Because so it's the rank. The curve, you get yeah, if X is the curve, let's, yeah, we'll see what we get if X is a curve. Okay? So let's do that. Let's do the case of curves. Because I'm not going to, I was going to do the case, also show you how I made this computation of the Euler characteristic of a quadric, you can also, you can take x essentially to be, you take a quadric and you blow it up along a smaller quadric and you get a map to P1, but let's not do that because we don't have time. So, I've got just five minutes, so let's do the case, let's do the classical riemann hurwitz formula, so the quadratic refinement from it. So, Let's take a map, let's take x now as a curve. F is a map, and let's take C to be P1. It's not really necessary, but let's take, this is, this is my C. Okay, and notice that omega of P1 over K is equal to O P1 of minus two, which is O of minus one, tensor two. So I'm in good shape, I can use the formula. Okay. Oh, I should mention, I should really say this. So again, Cass and Vickelgren 
have done work in this direction, and they found explicit formulas building on some work of Eisenbud, some old old work. Uh, I think this is how you saw it, Kiyashvili and Harold Levine. Not me, no relation. So for these local contributions and more generally, all the local contributions associated to an isolated zero of a section. So just want to mention their work. Um, okay, so we have this map and uh, yeah, we assume that it has you know these points x1 up to xl. These are the usual ramification points. This is where df equals zero. And um, now I wave my hands a little bit about various things like saying this thing was a square, so these guys live in the same group. But you actually have to be a little careful about choosing the isomorphism. What that means explicitly is near wherever, in this case, when you want to make these local contributions, near those points, you have your m and you have to choose a generating section for the m and use its square as the generating section for the m squared, which is then isomorphic to your l. And so what that means concretely in this case is the following. Let's assume, just by change of coordinates in the p1, we can always assume this, that these xi's, these xj's, actually live in the usual affine space inside of p1. This is, you know, spec of k t, okay? We can always assume that. And then you have the normalized coordinate. So if xj was a rational point, the normalized coordinate would be t minus xj. Oh, sorry, this is f of xj. Sorry, let's call that cj, sorry. Assume that's in there, this is a normalized coordinate. And what is that? It's something which if X, if cj was a rational point, should be t minus cj. And the way you do that is you let, let g i of t equal the monic, doesn't have to be, monic irreducible polynomial corresponding to xj. xj is a maximal ideal in here, so corresponding generator for that maximal ideal is a monic polynomial, and we let t cj equal gi of t divided by its derivative, usual derivative, viewed as an element in the local ring of cj. Okay, so if you look at what this is, if you take the, the g and you write it as a product of t minus the conjugates, you'll see what you're dividing by is exactly something which leaves you with t minus cj in the modulo the, modulo the uh, square of the maximal ideal. Okay, so that's your coordinate. And then what you can do is that if you take at xj, you let txj in oxxj be a local parameter. And then you can write f star of tcj as a unit, uj times txj to the nj for u, j, a unit, this is a j, okay? And then we have a formula for the local contribution. Well, it involves the derivative, right? We're taking df. So what is it? You take the derivative, which means nj times uj, and you evaluate at xj, so you reduce it mod the maximal ideal. This is something in the residue field. You take that one-dimensional quadratic form, but then you have the power nj minus 1, and instead of the integer nj minus 1, you should all know now what comes, times the sum uh, i equals uh, 0 to nj minus 2 minus 1 to the i. So this is, this is the quadratic forms person integer nj minus 1. Right, it's the form of rank, so it's that thing. That's the contribution, and so it gives you the following formula. 
<coughs> yeah, sorry, I'm one minute over time. Just write, I'll write down the formula and make one silly comment, and then we'll be done. Oops. So then we get the following amusing formula. So, so the thing is, we already know what the Euler characteristic of both terms are, because we already know these are odd dimensional smooth projective varieties, so their Euler characteristics are hyperbolic. So that's not the new information here. Uh, what do we get? Then, if you take the sum of the traces from kxj down to k, so I'm assuming it's separable, of this n j u j bar times the sum minus one to the i, i equals zero to n j minus two. This thing is hyperbolic, and which hyperbolic is gx minus one plus, well, for the Riemann sphere, it's be minus, minus one times the degree of f, so that's that, times h. Okay, so if you take the rank of this one, it's twice this thing. It's the usual formula you get. And this thing, the rank of this thing, is just going to be this number here, which is the sum of nj minus 1s. So what does this tell you? It's some funny business that the leading terms give you something hyperbolic. That's the extra information. And notice, so this, is, this implies, this, this is equivalent to the usual riemann hurwitz formula plus the fact that if you take the sum over all xj such that nj is even, see a lot of these, this is almost a hyperbolic form, right? And you just throw away all the hyperbolic parts and you take this trace from kxj down to k of nj uj bar, this is hyperbolic. Okay, so went over time. Sorry about that. That's the end of the story. Thank you very much. Questions? Is there a classical version of the Riemann-Hermes theorem for, for surfaces over the curve? Uh, well, the classical version, it's a, I think it's the zoyden segre invariance. So what it, if you apply the same formula, what it does, I mean, if you look at the case, let me look at the, the, I'll just tell you what the local invariants are here, if you map to P1. So you do the same story, you have a point X where DF of X is zero, and you let C be F of X, and then you take this, you know, G, you know, you take the same normalized coordinates TC, and then you look at F star of TC, and at x, you use coordinates t1 up to tn, right? You have just whatever coordinates. And you write this, if it's a, it, it'll be a sum, aij, ti, tj, plus higher order terms, right? And let's assume that it's a non-degenerate critical point, which means that the Hessian matrix has non-zero determinant. And then at that, it turns out then that the local contribution of df is just equal to the determinant of the Hessian matrix. In other words, it's just, you know, it's two to some power, two to, two to the dimension times the determinant of the AIJs, the symmetric matrix. So that's the local contribution. And if you look at this formula, wherever it went, it's not there anymore, but if you do this over the reals, this is either plus one or minus one, and it's telling you what you already know from Morse theory, that if you have a bundle over the circle, right, we're doing this to P1, then the real points are a circle. If you take a bundle over a circle, the Euler class is just gotten by the sum of the signs of the Morse indices. Right? In other words, you have pluses and minuses, you take this, you, know, you take the determinant of the, you know what I'm saying, you take minus one to the Morse index, 
you take that sum and that gives you the Euler characteristic of the total space. So this is kind of a refinement to algebraic geometry of that fact from Morse theory. Thank you. Yeah. Concrete problem in a numerical geometry now? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, for that, you'll have to go to my next lecture. <laughs> no, for most problems in it, well, I mean, there might be some. But, um, well, I mean, we had this problem of calculating the Euler. Well, we already know what that is for curves. But um, this, like this problem of the 27 lines on the cubic, I mentioned that Cass and Wickelgren uh, did this, so I'll show you another way to do it, I ho hopefully, uh, tomorrow by just really calculating the Euler class of symmetric powers of rank of bundles. And then, uh, you know, you get a formula for that and sort of will do. So, yeah, that's, that would be a typical enumerative problem that it kind of refines, yeah. So yeah. You mentioned the I didn't quite get your question. Can you repeat it? I didn't understand the question. Uh, so there seems uh, two ways to get the push forward for child weight. Ah, two ways. You mean using the trace or using this yeah. formula? No, well, not really. But, well, I mean, I just made the formula explicit. So, in fact, in order to, def so in order to define the, so Fazel defines the push forward. And in order to do that, he essentially relies, I mean, okay, it's a, theor it's a theorem. He shows that his push forward in this case is just the, um, this trace map. So um, it's not really two different, I mean, it's not really two different ways. It's just a formula for what it is. Yeah. Use some characteristic classes and you stress the chi of the. Uh, ah. Um, well, re yeah, that's more chi of the coherent sheaf. I think, I, I mean, well, there are, right? Aren't there relations? What's the Riemann law tell you about the, the topological Euler characteristic and the relation? Yeah, but it's not calculated. These Euler characteristics are not calculating the sheaf. These, these, these Euler classes are not calculating the sheaf Euler characteristic. They're calculating, like, it's like a churn class. So, I, yeah, I mean, it's just like a top churn class. So I don't know if there's a relation. I see. I see what you're saying. No, I, uh, I don't know what the other side of the equation would be. You could try and write down some equation involving these classes I'll define uh, tomorrow, these Pontryagin classes and the Euler class, but I don't know what that would have to do with the chief care. Yeah, what, what about it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so in, in classical uh, most theory, was this uh, Andrea Lee Franco theorem, which is included in Milner's books. What's that? Oh, the fact that the cohomology vanishes above a degree? Which, which form? Yeah, it's, it's, it's one way of saying it. Right. Yeah. So, th so that's that's like another. That's sort of theoretically beyond where we're at. So uh, the theory is essentially a triangulated theory. So you only get triangulated type invariants at this point. It's very difficult to get. So if you think of the topological space, you take its chain complex or cochain complex. You can kind of get invariants which tell you about the whole complex, but it's difficult to get invariants that tell you about just one cohomology group. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, an Euler characteristic is available, but saying that the cohomology vanishes below a certain dimension is not available. Uh, How easy is it to read your proofs if you assume that the field is algebraically closed? Well, uh, I mean, you know, you understand that things degenerate completely. Yeah, I don't think it really. I don't know if. I don't know if it helps any. I mean, I think that tech. Yeah, I don't think it makes it any easier. I don't think it helps. 
<laughs> it's not that bad, is it that bad? <laughs> just, just asking for anything to help, right? How about... <laughs> I don't know. Try using a brighter light, maybe. I don't know. No, that, that won't help. I don't think that'll help. Sorry. So I sympathize, though. Yeah, I sympathize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that the reason why not extension and extension and Yeah. Uh, is that, yeah, because essentially, I mean, you have the same kind of formula. You have a projection formula. When you pull back and push forward, it's multiplication by the trace of the identity. And since the trace of the identity is a form of odd rank, you know if you multiply by something of odd rank in the Grotendieck dieck witt group, that's injective. Right? Because there's only, the only torsion is two torsion. Yeah, that's exactly right. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay, then, uh, yeah, thank you very much.